We are back. Season two, episode one of Esther's Breeze. Thank you all so much for joining us. This is where we sit back, chat, and shoot the breeze. A huge thank you to PAX Management, Robert D'Alessio, who is my good friend and mentor, to my co-producer, Mr. Fernando Renzer, Renzo, that is, and to the publicist extraordinaire, Stephen Joyner. Uh, Esther's Breeze is available on Esther's Breeze YouTube channel, on Bobby Short Short's YouTube channel, and on Esther Brzezinski's Facebook profile. The audio is then extracted and uploaded to um, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many other streaming platforms. So we are so excited to be here tonight. This is our first episode in seven months, and I'm super excited because we have a really, really great and fascinating guest. So today's guest is Mr. Steve Rubin. Stephen J. Rubin is an internationally recognized author, film historian, producer, screenwriter, and promoter. He is the author of nine books, including The Twilight Zone Encyclopedia, The James Bond Encyclopedia, and Secrets of the Great Science Fiction Films. He also recently started a podcast called Saturday Night at the Movies. Let's bring him on. Hey, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? Oh, I'm great. I'm great. Thank you. Happy New Year to everybody. Of course, I, I'm not sure when you can stop saying that, but I, I'm still saying Happy New Year. Oh, let's go for Let's say February 28th is the cutoff date, all right? Sounds <laughs> good. Sounds very good. Yeah. By, by, the, by the way, my podcast is technically called Steve Rubin's Saturday Night at the Movies. Okay. Because there, apparently there are a lot of people who have Saturday Night at the Movies podcast, but I'm the only one podcasting perhaps from Hollywood. That's very true. Well, thank you for the correction. I actually did know that and it was written down incorrectly, but that's okay. So you are what we call a, a um, you know, a, a jack of all trades. You are a writer, producer, pop culture historian, DVD uh, commentarian, a talent manager, and now you're a podcaster. But you're probably best known for your books on the James Bond movies. So your first one is the James Bond movies, and then the the the, the one you had afterwards was the complete James Bond movie encyclopedia, which you are now in your fourth edition. So I'm curious, what was the evolution of this process, and why such a keen interest? Best. Well, um, I think that uh, I was I was born a film buff, I guess you could say, because uh, I lived across from from the ages of, I'd say, five to ten. I lived literally across the street from a movie theater. So I was at the movies every Saturday with my friends. We'd see double features, usually science fiction and horror films. My mom was a, both my parents were big film buffs, so they would take me to the movie. So as I was living at the movie theater. So it was not unusual to take my background in film and start to apply it to something. I was a history major at UCLA. Uh, I was a writer for the college paper, The Daily Bruin. An interesting era to be writing in, I was writing during Watergate. So it was a great time to be a journalist. And when I got out of college, my first book was called Combat Films, American Realism, 1945 to 1970. And I sold a grand total of 432 copies. And I said to myself, if this is what book publishing is all, all about, I better get out of the business or find something more interesting. That's the updated edition, which I, I, I got out in 2010. So I was looking around for a topic, and this is the mid-70s. Right. No one had done anything of serious note in researching the history of the James Bond movies. And I had started writing for a Chicago film journal at that time called Cine Fantastique which covered science fiction, fantasy, and horror movies. And I kind of, kind of, I don't know if I necessarily pioneered it, but I certainly got into heavy forensic history based on interviewing the actual participants. So I decided to take a chance and approach Albert R. Broccoli. And, you know, he's the one who's the, literally the godfather of yeah, James Bond. producer, I believe, of the series, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And I got him on a good day. And not only did <laughs> I have a terrific interview with him, but I was introduced to his stepson, Michael G. Wilson, in London that summer, and I got access to everything. They opened their filing cabinets to me. So as a researcher, it was the Rosetta Stone moment. 
And uh, I did a bunch of original interviews and my book came out and the first edition sold 50,000 copies. So as a writer, that was a big deal then. Uh, you know, it's it, it wasn't necessarily what I was making a living at because, you know, book writing is very spotty, but it got me on the right track. And at the same time, I started becoming a professional in, in the film business. I, I became a publicist for the studios. Uh, but the fourth edition of the James Bond Encyclopedia just came out. Uh, actually, it's been out a year. Right. And has includes No Time to Die, uh, which, of course, is the last James Bond movie. Um, and Loved no it. Yeah, I no spoilers here. I'm not going to betray that because a lot of people still haven't seen I it. I know, and I won't say anything. Zip. But the fun thing about writing about Bond is it's forever. Yeah. You know, you write about a subject sometimes and it's done. But with Bond, there's always something new to write about. It's the longest running film film series in, in history. There's no reason to think it'll ever end. I, I actually personally predict that we'll be watching Bond movies. Well, maybe you and I won't be watching Bond movies, but in the 20 sec 22nd century, they'll be doing Bond movies. I wouldn't be surprised. And do you have a preference of, of any actor playing Bond? Is there one that you prefer over all the others? Well, it's according to my research, research, it's axiomatic that you love the Bond you grow up with. So in my case, it was from the beginning, Sean Connery. Yeah. Uh, I didn't see the first two James Bond movies when they were, re were released theatrically. Dr. No and From Russia With Love did not get much fanfare in terms of their release. So the first Bond movie I saw was at Christmas 1964. I saw Goldfinger. And Goldfinger was literally an event, what we would think today would be like the Avengers or Star Wars. I mean, Christmas 64 was a big deal. By then, most of my classmates in middle school had started reading, reading the Ian Fleming novels, which were available in these colorfully covered paperbacks. In fact, it's funny, my dad would come home from business trips and he'd always bring home Westerns. For some reason, my dad loved reading Westerns. I had no interest in reading Westerns. But one day he comes home and he drops a book on my desk has a naked woman on the cover. Oh my goodness. You know, she's all in gold and she's kind of covered in the right places. Right. Uh, but he says, you, sh you might like this. And he had given me the Goldfinger book. So that was that same year that Goldfinger opened. So the idea of seeing a movie after reading the book was very cool. And uh, so that started me being a fan. And then of course, interviewing Cubby Broccoli and then doing all of my research over the years. I've been writing about Bond for over 40 years. So it's it's kind of um it's an interesting thing. I'm not I'm not inside anymore though. I'm kind of the maverick uh historian. I have to kind of gather all of my research and photographic materials outside the ages of Eon Productions, Unite Artists, but that's fine. I stay on my side of the fence, they stay on their side of the fence, and meanwhile I, I'm able to uh, get my books out. But originally you had access to Pinewood Studios, correct? When you first went there in the 70s to the UK? Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, I, I went out to Pinewood Studios with director Terrence Young, who directed Dr. No for Marshall with Love and Thunderball. And uh, the production designer, Sid Kane, who did from uh, did uh, Live and Let Die and Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Yeah, Pinewood was great. I, I, I did a lot of research there. In fact, um, one of their construction coordinators opened his trunk to me with all these wonderful behind the scenes photographs, which no one had ever seen. So wow. it really made my book terrific. And since then I've tried to gather the most interesting photographic materials. The latest edition of the James Bond movie encyclopedia has almost 400 photos. That's incredible. <clears throat> that is. So you were there in the seventies. Did you get to meet Roger Moore? I think he was, he had just completed his film when you arrived to the UK. Did you get to meet him? Well, at all? I arrived uh, about two minutes after they wrapped the spy who loved me. So oh, I didn't no. have to meet Roger. <laughs> uh, the thing about the movies, I have to say this over the years, the best stories were told by the writers and the directors. So, you know, the questions I would ask Roger, he was probably he probably answered 50,000 times. And I didn't feel as if I by not reaching the bonds, although uh, I did have a, a extensive interview with George Lazenby, who was the actor who replaced Sean Connery. And he's been um, touted lately as being kind of the under 
underestimated, uh, underrated Bond, and I agree 100%. There's an interesting story about Lazenby. He kind of talked his way into an interview claiming he had done a bunch of films in Eastern Europe and that he was experienced. And his look was so perfect. Albert Broccoli and his partner then, Harry Saltzman, just went gaga over him. And he was assigned to appear in the sixth James Bond movie, Honor Majesty's Secret Service. And shortly thereafter, he met Peter Hunt, the director. And Peter was a driving force of the series. He was the editor on the first five James Bond movies. The editing style he brought to the movies was just very adventurous at that time. And he told, he told, uh, George told Peter on the QT, I have no acting experience whatsoever. And Peter nearly fainted. And the challenge, uh, which I think was achieved, was to make him bond. And if you watch the movie, he's the most comfortable actor, I think, to ever play Bond. He just kind of floated right into the role, and he's good with his fists. He had an interesting look. And I think that if George had stayed with the series, he would have, I think, done, done really well. But um, there were some issues. Um, to get a performance out of George, Peter Hunt, the director, decided to stay away from him and not overly instruct him. And George began to feel a little isolated. Hmm. When the film wrapped, his agent at the time told him that Bond was over and that he should not continue in the role. And he was offered a seven-year contract, which he turned down. My goodness. In the history of Hollywood, no one has ever gotten the worst advice like that. It was just horrible. So uh, George left. They brought Sean Connery back for one more in Diamonds Are Forever. And then they, the Roger Moore era took over from 73 on. Um, but George, the, that movie, Honor Majesty's Secret Service, if you haven't seen it, it's just a wonderfully produced James Bond movie. And George Lazenby was terrific. Hmm. And in my research, I... I saw that David Niven played Bond, I think, in one of the films. Well, interestingly, when Broccoli and his partner Saltzman got the rights to all the books from Ian Fleming, the one book, they, well, there were two that he couldn't get rights to. One was sold to a actor in 1952 named Gregory Ratoff, who later sold it to Charles K. Feldman, one of the top agents in Hollywood, the rights to Casino Royale. Hmm. And by the time... Uh, Feldman started to think about making the movie. Connery had already started to appear in the Bond. So he realized he couldn't do a serious competitive Bond. So he decided to do a big lumbering spoof with David Niven being the retired James uh, Bond. Right, yes. Woody right. Allen plays his nephew, Peter <laughs> Sellers. It's the, it's the goofiest, the, the most lame-brained spoof ever. Everybody's in it because Feldman was an agent who knew everybody. Right. But it didn't work. They had five directors, six writers. It was a big lumbering problem. It's funny because when in my first interview with Albert R. Broccoli, he told me that when Casino Royale came out in spring of 1967, everybody thought that was the official James Bond movie that year. So when their real Bond movie opened that year, the Nancy Sinatra flavored song, You Only Live Twice, right. Connery, it didn't do as well as Thunderball, the previous Bond. So he, he kind of got, uh, Broccoli kind of got to the point where he did not want to see any rivals in the marketplace. And that's why he fought a 20-year battle to prevent there being a Thunderball remake uh, or, or, or a sequel, uh, which is what happened to that second property, which he did not own. Um, what happened was when Ian Fleming was writing his novels, they weren't selling that well. But what happened was, he was approached by a British producer named Kevin McClory. And Kevin said to Ian Fleming, and it's kind of a brazen thing to say, he didn't think any of the books were cinematic, which of course is BS. But he said that let's get my friend Jack Whittingham, who was a screenwriter, and let's write a, a movie with a lot of visuals. Uh, McClory had just worked with Mike Todd on the movie Around the World in 80 Days. So he knew about big production value and doing something very cinematic. And so they wrote a, a movie called Latitude 78 West, which was about an A-bomb being hijacked by an enemy power, originally the mafia. And they couldn't sell it. Nobody wanted to buy it. It was just another screenplay for another series of books that nobody cared about. So uh, Ian Fleming, the author, did a very bad thing. He actually 
decided to write a book called Thunderball without giving credit to McClory or Whittingham. And they sued him in the High Court of London. And over a three-year period, they eventually won all the film rights to Thunderball. So when Broccoli and Saltzman started making their films, they didn't own Thunderball. And they realized it was one of the best books in the series. So they made a deal with Kevin McClory that they would produce it together. And when you see the movie Thunderball, it, the producing credit is Kevin McClory. And, cool. and what, hap what happened was uh, McClory had all these drafts of the original story. And he claimed there was the mafia, there was Spectre, blah, blah, blah. But he uh, signed a deal that he would not do anything else with the Thunderball property for 10 years. Promptly in 1975, 10 years later, he announced a new Bond movie called James Bond of the Secret Service. And Broccoli, having already gone through that craziness on Casino Royale with the rival Bond movie, was not going to let that happen again. So there was a major legal battle that McClory uh, fought and fought and couldn't do anything until he met a gentleman named Jack Schwartzman, who was a lawyer originally with Lawyer Lorimar. And Schwartzman examined all of uh, McClory's paperwork and said, you know, you could do another version of this movie. You have the rights. And so what happened is in 1983, Warner Brothers released a movie called Never Say Never Again, which brought back Sean Connery for his last time as Bond. And uh, it's interesting you know, and we've been talking about Broccoli fighting Casino Royale, Broccoli fighting right. Thunderball remakes. It turned out in 83, it was also the same year that they brought out Octopussy, which was the official Roger Moore film that year. So there were two Bond films that year. Both of them did pretty well. So it wasn't as big a deal. And you had a falling out with Broccoli yourself. Is that correct? And you sort well, of got caught no, in the I, middle? It's it's just that um, the it, it was just a misunderstanding. I mean... <clears throat> Cubby wanted to do kind of his story, and I, I don't blame him because he's so tied up with Bond. But with all of my interviews with all these people, it was not just Cubby's story. And I think he didn't want to correct what he felt was their incorrect information. So he kind of walked away from the project. But my editor at Santa Fantastique had the gall to take an ad out in the magazine without telling me anything. And he put Cubby Broccoli's face inside a gun sight. And he said, who is this producer and why does he want this book stop? And Michael Wilson, who was always friendly to the project, just blew a fuse and said, we are, we're we just not going to deal with you anymore. So I was really caught in the middle of something really stupid that should never have happened because I'm one of the biggest fans in the world of Bond. I only write pretty much positive stuff about them. I, you know, in my book, I do review all the films and I don't give A pluses to everyone because you can't. But uh, I still love the Bonds, and I just have a lot of fun talking about it. Yeah, that was almost sort of yeah. a, the old style clickbait that we we see these days. That that was the style that he put out. So I have to ask you: you co-wrote a book. Is, called, um, yes, you froze for a moment. <laughs> I, so I, I have to ask. Yeah. Can you hear me? We Are we back on? Yeah, we are back on. I can hear you. Okay. We're just a little can lag. Yeah, okay. I can hear you. Okay. No problem. So I have to ask you about the Sunspots. cat who lived with Anne Frank. So you co-wrote that book. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes. Yes. Uh, it's a very special book. My friend David Lee Miller and I uh, conceived of it, and now we're turning it into a animated feature. Um, I was listening to the soundtrack one day to The Diary of Anne Frank, the 1959 George Stevens movie with Millie Perkins. And uh, I there's a scene in the movie where they're chasing this cat around, Peter's cat. Peter brought a cat into the, the attic named Mushi. <laughs> and it suddenly dawned on me, uh, what did the cat think of all these people who can't go outside and tiptoe around most of the day? And I mentioned it to David and we said, this is a story and this is an important story for young people to know about because the Holocaust is a very difficult subject to communicate to young people. Yes. It's so horrific that where do you where do you get in the door? And uh, God love Anne Frank, her story has always been a way of introducing horrific events in a more, you know, a, I don't want to say palatable, but I, I just in a way that they might understand. And then 
telling the story from the cat's point of view was even really more interesting for us because Mushi, unlike Anne and everybody else in the attic, Mushi goes out every day. M Mushi right. goes out through the coal chute, wanders around Amsterdam, and we see that the the uh, city has become an, like a, a prison. It's, it's armed guards, dogs patrolling. And basically the book is a, a kind of a, a starting off point for an animated feature where we take Mushi out and he joins the Dutch animal resistance against the Nazis. But in our story, the Nazis are personified by the German Shepherd and Rottweiler dogs that patrol the canals. So the movie okay. becomes a metaphor. It has touches of the Lion King. It has touches of, uh, in terms of atmosphere, Ratatouille, because in Ratatouille, Paris becomes a big character in that story. In our story, Amsterdam becomes a big character. And um, it's it's just, uh, it, it's, it's opened up so many ideas for us. And we've actually sold the pro well, we sold the project once to a French company, but they went out of business and we got the IP back. Okay. And now we're out there looking for financing for the feature at a time when I think this this movie is more important than ever. I agree. Semitism is on the rise. There it is. is so much misinformation out there that people, these these Holocaust deniers are just, you know, they're, they're just completely absorbing some of the, you know, the world of their, and people just don't know. The uh, USA Today did a study last year that 40% of the people they interviewed had never heard of the Holocaust. I mean, it's, especially amongst young people, you know, so we think the cat who lived with Anne Frank would be uh, a very important feature for the world and four quadrants. It has something for everybody. It has humor, it has pathos, it has adventure. Uh, we have a great villain. The, the the main Rottweiler in the story's name is Blitzkrieg, and <laughs> he's he's a tough hombre. I th I think it is perfect timing. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg was suspended uh, because she claimed that it wasn't about race, that the Holocaust was not about race, which no. was completely ridiculous. Completely ridiculous, and she should know better. She's a smart lady. I think that. Uh, we're in strange times. I think there's too much misinformation out there. And I think that uh, the Jews seem to be blamed for everything. Don't we have space lasers destroying the the, the, the wildfires? You know, it's, well, it's that's a new like, one. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. And so uh, we're, we're working with the Simon Wiesenthal Center in, in oh, Los Angeles. Perfect. And we're getting in, we're going to be in, they, 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 they did a special event on Holocaust Remembrance Day a couple years ago with the book. And we've had great response. Um, it's, it's time to do this. You know, I'm a working screenwriter in Hollywood. I'm working on a lot of different subjects. And, and this is one of the special ones. So if somebody wants to help you produce this, how do they contact you? Uh, I'll give you my email right this minute. I mean, we, we would love to hear from people because we need to find some development funds to create some of the initial drawings to sell it. So right. we're trying to raise the first million dollars. And my email address is Steve, S-T-E-V-E-J-A-Y, Ruben, R-U-B-I-N at gmail.com. And, uh, you know, we 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 think we've got something enormously special and enormously entertaining. It's not like we're doing a documentary that's going to be seen just by Jews. We're hoping the whole world sees this movie. And I think we have an opportunity to spread a good story. Yeah, I agree. We will definitely put it in the uh, description on our uh, YouTube channels for sure. We'll add it on afterwards so that people can contact you. Yeah, that would be wonderful. I would love to see that as a feature. So let's talk about your podcast, Steve Rubin's Saturday Night at the Movie. So tell me about it. Well, uh, well, first of all, Saturday Night at the Movies has always had a very nice ring for me because that was the first primetime movie show on television. Uh, and NBC brought it out fall of 62. So the, we were able to watch full-length feature films on in primetime. And I always remember the theme. I always remember the fun. Saturday nights were very special. Um, I, having done all of this research and interviewing in Hollywood over the years, interviewing filmmakers, actors, writers, special effects people, I felt that uh, it would be fun to now present this material in a weekly series uh, so people could, you know, hear the stories. Uh, and it's all about history, you know, the, the, with as many of the people who were involved in the shows as original or, or authors who are covering topics. Um, 
One of the first people I had on was Donna Anderson, who's one of the last surviving cast members of the great anti-nuke movie, On the Beach. And she talked about working in Australia with Gregory Peck and Ava Gardner. Last night we were talking to Billy Gray, who uh, everybody knows him from Father Knows Best, but he was the star of uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still, the original. Uh, next week we're gonna have uh, Nicholas uh, Meyer who directed uh, Time After Time and Star Trek II. Uh, I'm just having a lot of fun chatting with people and just reveling in the film history that we all love. Amazing. So you were a writer in the documentary, The Coolest Guy Movie Ever Made, Return to the Scene of the Great Escape, and you actually got to meet Steve McQueen at one time in your life, your movie uh, superhero, I, I, is that correct? <laughs> Yeah, it was it was kind of one of those crazy LA moments. I was riding my little Schwinn Stingray bicycle with the faux leopard skin seat on my way to a slot car track to race my little sports car, and I'm sitting at the corner of Motor and uh, one of the streets in Palms, and I hear a voice ring out. Can you tell me where MGM Studios is? And I turn around, and there's Steve McQueen in a red Ferrari. Oh Why God. is he asking me where MGM is? Because he's been going there for years. Right. But I, learned, I learned later that Steve McQueen liked to talk to kids because he really oh. identified with young people. He would stay away from talking with adults and he was never interviewed for, you know, very rarely was he interviewed for anything. I think he was on Johnny Carson a couple of times. Right. But he was always very sensitive about his education, et cetera. But here I am having a conversation. I had just seen The Great Escape. This was the summer of 63. I had just seen The Great Escape. Oh my God moment royale. I mean, it's just one of those <laughs> great sure. moments. And um, The Great Escape is my desert island movie. You know, you, you get asked that question if you could had to go to a desert island with one movie, what would you bring? So my movie is The Great Escape, which is featured in my book, Combat Films, but I've also done two documentaries. Before I did the coolest guy movie ever, I did Return to the Great Escape, which was on Showtime in 93. I was on the commentary track for the first uh, special feature DVD. I was nominated for best classic commentary that year by the DVD Academy. Wow. I lost some guy named Peter Jackson and Lord of the Rings. You know, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's but, a good uh, way to lose. Oh, yeah. No, that was good company. Um, uh, and it's just one of those movies that plays and plays and plays for me. I've always loved that movie. And, you know, uh, I was approached by a French filmmaker who had taken a camera crew to all the locations where they made the film in 62. And um, we did a then and now, uh, you know, uh, we put them up next to each other to see what the locations look like today. And that's uh, the, the title of it, as you mentioned, is... Uh, the coolest guy movie ever. And it's uh, it's from Virgil uh, Films and Entertainment. It's available on uh, Amazon. It's actually a fun film. I got um, Lawrence Montaigne, the Canadian actor, to, to, um, to narrate, and he's wonderful. He plays one of the guys in the uh, original Escape Place, Haynes, the Canadian, who gets into a fight with James Coburn's character, a, a faux fight at the beginning of the movie as they're trying to escape from the get-go. And... Uh, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. When we did the document, the first documentary, Return to the Great Escape in 93, right. I, uh, I went over to uh, Germany and I went to the actual studio where the film was made. And then we went off into Bavaria looking for some of the locations, which were very hard to find. But we interviewed people like James Garner and James Coburn and Donald Pleasance and David McCallum. And it was great. That's amazing. And you also did a encyclopedia version of one of my favorite all-time shows, The Twilight Zone. So Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I, I uh, as a screenwriter in Hollywood, sometimes you go literally years not doing anything because you're in development hell. So I've decided that I've got to get back into writing books. And I, it was between Bond books. And I love The Twilight Zone like you do. And I got mm -hmm. to be friendly with Carol Serling, Rod Serling's widow. Wow. And just like Cubby Broccoli opened the filing cabinets for Bond, she opened the filing cabinets for Serling. So I was able to tell you how much people made in those days, how much roles. It's, you'd be surprised what these iconic roles in this great TV series, what these actors made. I mean, top of show in 1959 was $5,000. Now, $5,000 in 1959 is probably really good money, but today it seems like a pittance. Do you have a favorite episode? 
The one I always seem to uh, gravitate towards is uh, the wonderful Burgess Meredith episode where he goes, that. The, goes into the bank vault every day where it's the only place he can read freely and the world ends and he comes out and he has all these books he can get to read and uh, it's called Time Enough at Last. Everybody knows that as the glasses ep episode. It's just one of those great ones. The other one that people talk about a lot is... Um, is Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, where uh, William Shatner, Captain Kirk is in an right. airline seat and looks out the window and sees a gremlin tearing up the uh, the cowling. Yes, yes I remember that episode. Oh, yeah. yeah Directed by, by Richard Donner, who went on to direct the Superman movies and uh, and the Lethal Weapon movies. Uh, just really fun. Here's a funny story. Um, <laughs> Donner goes to get a cup of coffee. They're filming in a tank. Which is a which is a soundstage with a big swimming pool underneath to collect the water because on the wing there's a storm going as this gremlin's tearing up the wing, so he hears a scream from the set, and he comes racing back with his coffee and he looks down at the bottom of the tank and William Shatner's lying face uh -huh. down. He thinks he's dead, <laughs> and then Shatner just turns around and starts laughing, and the whole crew busts up. Oh and the my god! Was really pissed. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a question from Sonia Huggins. She wants to know where did Steve grow up? West Los Angeles. I was born in Chicago. My right. father could not take the winters anymore, so he moved us to L.A., where his brother had a business, and I grew up in West L.A. Sure. Yeah, and you went to UCLA, is that correct? I went to UCLA. Go Bruins. Yeah. <laughs> so this is going to be this season's question that I'm going to ask every guest. Okay. So if you could turn back the time and talk to your 18-year-old self, what would you tell him? Buy a stock called Apple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's that's the easy answer. I think I would tell my 18 year old self to um, that's that's a that's a really good question, you know, Esther. I think that it's you know it's it's like going back and trying to correct things. I think um, I would have probably told myself to get more and well this is interesting kind of get more involved in the jewish community okay. I, I grew up totally away from that and not that i needed to go to temple or anything like that but the social atmosphere was probably a lot more inviting for me than going to a discotheque and dancing my you know my ass off <laughs> uh, you know it is fun but it has it's kind of an empty calorie so i think right. socially i might have yeah, you know, making connections as well because it's always good to make connections. And I probably I didn't get married till I was forty two, wow. so uh, I waited quite a long time. And I think so. I, I, I'd probably tell myself to to be a little more social. Uh, I, you know, I was an only child, so I was used to being able to entertain myself by being on my own. So uh, there wasn't, uh, you know, I had lots of friends though, and uh, but I think that I. I kind of followed the John Travolta Saturday Night Fever equation for a while, you know, dancing right. around. Because uh, when I went to Europe on that first grade, uh, first James Bond research trip, that was the height of quote unquote disco fever. And I, I, I watched, yeah, I watched yeah. people dancing and they were having such great times that uh, I said, wow. So when I came back to LA, I just said, I got to go to disco decks and dance. It was a, <laughs> kind of empty calories. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that the Bond movies kind of influenced your perception of uh, relationships and how women should be and how women should look? Because the women in, in the James Bond films were incredibly gorgeous. Do you think that had some effect on, on you in that it way? It completely ruined me. <laughs> That's what I thought. You know, there's a scene in Goldfinger. You know, Goldfinger is my favorite Bond movie where Bond is driving the Aston Martin down a Swiss highway and he's passed by this gorgeous woman in a Mustang. Right. And he starts to rev up the accelerator, and then he suddenly says, "Discipline, 007, discipline." <laughs> I should have said that more. <laughs> so, do you think that they're going to have a female 007, or did they retire 007? Well, first of all, this is always gets you into hot, hot water, and when you say that, okay, has got to be a, a white guy from the Commonwealth. Yikes. And, you know, you say that and you're immediately uh, accused of being a racist. But 
for 60 plus years, they've had a successful series with a white guy from the Commonwealth. I just don't see them changing that. You know, Lashana Lynch did a nice job with the moniker 007 in the latest Bond movie, but she was yeah. just given the ID number. She's not James Bond. Right. And as he, everybody says this, that, you know, that Bond should be a guy. I mean, the women can have their own series, but Bond should be a guy. It's like a female Tarzan. You're not going to do a female Tarzan. I mean, it's not going to work. I mean, you got to have, you got to have, um, you got to have Bond. I mean, I, it's interesting that over the years, a number of authors have written James Bond novels. You know, Ian Fleming died right after Goldfinger was released. He died in 1964 or just before. Right. So he missed most of the huge success of the Bond series. Interestingly, the Bond producers have never produced a non-Ian Fleming uh, you know, story. They do original stories, but they do not take them from anything uh, approaching uh, another author. So, you know, the Ian Fleming, there, there are only 12, I think there were 12 or 13 Bond novels and two collections of short stories, which ran out years ago. So they've been pretty much doing originals since The Spy Who Loved Me in 77. I don't see them changing. I just don't see them changing. Okay, no, I was curious. So what does the future hold for you? What are, you, what are your plans, Mr. Steve Rubin? Well, I'm not going to go to Mars. I, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Spending six months in a tin can and getting on a desert planet, not gonna work. No, um, I am um I'm I'm loving what I'm doing. I want to uh interesting the last eight years I've been writing nonstop comedy. Uh, I feel that comedy is one genre that has been depleted. Usually if you're seeing a movie, comedy can be very raunchy. And I think that um, you know, I I I like family comedies, the movies we always cite. We always cite Ghostbusters, Back right. to the Future, Night at the Museum, even The Wizard of Oz. Movies you can take your 87-year-old grandmother to and your six-year-old and everybody comes out smiling. There are not enough of those movies anymore. I feel that Hollywood's comedies have gotten, you know, The Hangover was a big hit. There was Hangover 2, Hangover 3, you know, uh, all these kinds of movies that sell kind of what we consider to be lazy writing, you know, going for the, the cheap joke scatological humor, F-bombs. We don't write like that. We, I'm working with a wonderful Canadian writer from Montreal named Billy oh. Reback. Billy was one of the original writer producers on Home Improvement. He's a wonderful uh, writer and a great partner. Uh, we have great hopes for everything we're doing. We've written 19 spec screenplays. We've written nine television pilots. We've wow. been very busy and we're out there every day trying to sell them. So Christine says, I agree with Steve Rubin, Bond is a man. The fact that there are incredible, interesting and exciting and true women's life stories that would make excellent films. It takes a bit of research. Yeah, she has a point. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's great females. We're in a, Actually, we're in a very interesting period of female empowerment in films, especially action films. Yes. I mean, uh, you know, Wonder Woman, uh, and 19 other things like that. The recent uh, movie, although it didn't do very well, the 355 with a, it was kind of like a, a female uh, a cop thriller. I mean, women are no longer breathlessly on the side. They're right in the action. Yeah, you're right. And I think that's, uh, that's where we are. I mean, I believe strongly that women can do nearly everything men can do. And it's, I think it should be totally equal. I agree 100%. Thank you so much, Steve. You've been a joy to interview. Hopefully, we'll be able to bring you back again, and we'll find out what else you're doing. Well, we're um, going to talk. We're, we're going to be talking about the cat who lived with Anne Frank. Right, that's right. Very soon, very soon, because that's oh. going to be on the hopper. And I thank you so much, Esther. Really enjoyed the interview. Oh, I'm so glad we enjoyed having you. Thank you so much. So next week, or rather in two weeks, Esther's Breeze, uh, February 17th, we'll have Christine Stovall, who's the author of Songs of Souls Trilogy. And please tune in Monday at 8 o'clock for Rob's Inner Circle, where Rick Bowman from the heavy metal band Maitre from the Netherlands will be his guest. Guys, thank you so much. This has been incredible. It is so good to be back. And I can't wait to come back in two weeks and sit back and shoot the breeze with all of you. Ciao for now.